Chapter 15 of Police Your Planet by Lester Del Rey This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 15 Murdoch's Mantle There were three men, each with a white circle painted on chest and left arm, talking to Mother Corey when Bruce Gordon came down the rickety steps. He stopped for a second but there was no sign of trouble. Then the words of the thin man below reached him. So we figured when we found the stiffs maybe you'd come back, mother. Damn good thing we were right. We can sure use that ammunition you found. Now where's this Gordon fellow? Here, Gordon told the man. He'd recognized him finally as Schulberg, the little grocer from the 19th precinct. The man swung suspiciously then grinned weakly. There was hunger and strain on his face, but an odd authority and pride now. I'll be doggoned. Why ain't you say he was with Murdoch? They want someone to locate Ed Prager and see about getting some food shipped in from outside, Cobber, Mother Corey told him. They got some money scraped together, but the Hicks are doing no business with Marsport. You know, Ed. Just tell him I sent you. I'd go myself, but I'm getting too old to go chasing men out there. What's in it? Gordon asked, reaching for his helmet. There was a surprised exchange of glances from the others, but Mother Corey chuckled. Heart like a steel trap, Cobber, he said, almost approvingly. Well, you'll be earning your keep here, yours and that granddaughter's too. Here, you'll need direction for finding Prager. He handed the paper with his scrawling notes on it over to Gordon and went shuffling back. Gordon stuck it into his pouch and followed the three. Outside they had a truck waiting. Rusty and Corey's two henchmen were busy loading it with ammunition from the cellar. Schulberg motioned him into the cab of the truck and the other two climbed into the closed rear section. All right, Gordon said. What goes on? The other began explaining as he picked a way through the ruin and rubble. Murdoch had done better than Gordon had expected. He'd laid out a program for a citizen's vigilante committee, and had drilled enough in the ruthless use of the club to keep the gangs down. Once the police were all busy inside the dome with their private war, the committee had been the only means of keeping order in the whole territory beyond. It was now extended to cover about half the area as a voluntary police organization. He pointed outside. It was changed. There were fewer people outside. Gordon had never seen group starvation before. They passed a crowd around a crude gallows, and Schulberg stopped. A man was already dead and dangling. Should turn him over to us cops, Schulberg said. What's he hanged for? Hoarding, a voice answered and others supplied the few details. The dead man had been caught with a half bag of flour and part of a case of beans. Schulberg found a scrap of something and penciled the crime on it, together with a circle signature, and pinned it to the body. All food should be turned in, he explained to Gordon as they climbed back into the truck. We figure community kitchens can stretch things a bit more, and we give a half extra ration to the guys who can find anything useful to do. We got enough so most people won't starve to death for another week, I guess. But you'd better get Prager to send something, Gordon. Here. Here's the scratch we scraped up. He passed over a bag filled with a collection of small bills and coins. We can trust you, I guess, he said dully. Remember you with Murdoch, anyhow. And you can tell Prager we got plenty of men looking for work in case he can use them. He pulled up to shout a report through a big Mars speaker as they passed an old building Murdoch had used as a precinct house. It now had a crude sign proclaiming it Voluntary Police Headquarters and Outland Government Center. Then he went on until they came to a spur of the little electric monorail system, with three abandoned service engines parked at the end. Extra air inside, and the best we could do for food. Was going to try myself. But I don't know Prager, Schulberg said. He handed over a key and nodded toward the first service engine. Good luck, Gordon. And damn it, were...
We gotta eat, don't we? You tell him that. It ain't much, but get what you can. He swung the truck and was gone. Gordon climbed into the enclosed cab and pulled back questioningly on the only lever he could see. The engine backed briefly. He reversed the control. Then it moved forward, picking up speed. Apparently there was still power flowing in from the automatic atomic generators. He got off to puzzle out a switch using Mother Corey's scrawled instructions. He had vaguely expected to see more of Mars, but for eight hours there was only the bare flatness and dunes of unending sandy surface and scraggly useless native plants opened out to the sun. Marsport had been located where the only vein of uranium had been found on Mars, and the growing section was closer to the equator. Then he came to villages. Again there was the sight of children running around without helmets. He stopped once for directions, and a man stared at him suspiciously, and finally threw a switch reluctantly. He was finally forced to stop again, sure that he was near now. This time it was in what seemed to be a major shipping center in the heart of the lines that ran helter-skelter from village to village. Another suspicious-eyed man studied him. You won't find Prager on his farm. Couldn't reach it in that, anyhow, he said finally. Then he turned up his Mars speaker. Ed. Hey. Ed. Down the street the seal of a building opened, and the big bluff figure of Prager came out. His eyes narrowed as he spotted Gordon. Then he grinned and waved his visitor forward. Inside there was evidence of food, and a rather pretty girl brought out another platter and set it before Gordon. He ate while they exchanged uncertain rambling information. Finally he got down to his errand. Prager seemed to read his mind. I can get the stuff sent, Gordon. I'm head of the shipping committee for this quadrant. But why in the hell should I? The last time every car was looted in outer Marsport. If they won't let us get the oil and chemicals we need, why should we feed them? Ever see starvation, Gordon asked, wishing again someone else who'd felt it could carry the message. He told about a man who'd committed suicide for his kids, not stopping as Prager's face sickened slowly. Hell, who wouldn't loot your trains if that's going on? All right, if Mother Corey will back up this volunteer police group, I've got kids of my own. Look, you want food? We want to ship. Get your cops to give us an escort for every shipment through the dome, and we'll drop off one car out of four for the Outlands. Gordon sat back weakly. Done, he said. Provided the first shipment carries the most we can get for the credits I brought. It will. We've got some stuff that's about to spoil, and we can let you have a whole train of it. He took the sack of credits and tossed it toward a drawer, uncounted. A damned good thing security sending a ship. Credits won't be worth much until they get this mess straightened out. Gordon felt the hair at the base of his neck tingle. What makes you think security can do anything? They haven't shown a hand yet. They will, Prager said. You guys in Marsport feed yourself so many lies you begin to believe them. But security took Venus, and I'm not worried here in the long run. Don't ask me how. His voice was a mixture of bitterness and an odd certainty. They set security up as a nice little debating society, Gordon, to make it easy for North America to grab the planets by doing it through that agency. Only they got better men on it than they wanted. So far, security has played one nation against another, enough to keep any from daring to swipe power on the planets. And this latest trick folded up, too. North America figured on Marsport folding up once they got the police war started, with a bunch of chiseling profiteers as their front. They expected the citizens to yell uncle all the way back to Earth. But out here, nobody thinks of Earth as a place to yell to for help. So they missed, and now security's got Pan-Asia and United Africa balanced against North America, so the swipe won't work. We got the dope from our southern receiver. North America's called it all a mistaken emergency measure and turned it back to security. Along with how many war rockets, Gordon asked. None. They never gave any real power. Never will. 
The only strength security's ever had comes from the fact that it always wins somehow. Forget the crooks and crooked cops, man. Ask the people who've been getting kicked around about security, and you'll find that even most Marsport doesn't hate it. It's the only hope we've got of not having all the planets turn into colonial empires. You staying over, or want me to give you an engineer and drag car so you can ride back in comfort? Gordon stared at the room where almost everything was a product of the planet, at Prager and at the girl. Here was a real Mars, the men who liked it here, who were sure of their future. I'll take the drag car. He found Randolph waiting in a scooter outside the precinct house after he'd reported his results. He climbed in woodenly, leaving his helmet on as he saw the broken window. A good job, the little man said, and news for the paper, if I ever publish it again. I came over because I wasn't much use at the coop, and everyone else was busy. Doing what, Gordon asked. Randolph grinned crookedly, running outer Marsport. The mother's the only man everybody knows. I guess, and his word has never been broken that anyone can remember. So he's helping Schulberg make agreements with the sections the volunteers don't handle. Place is lousy with people now. Heard about Mayor Wayne? Gordon shook his head, not caring, but the man went on. He must have had his supply of drugs lifted somehow. He holed up one day until it really hit him that he couldn't get any more. Then he went gunning for Trench with some idea Trench had swiped the stuff. So Trench is now running the municipals. And I hear the gangs are just about in control of both sections lately. The chicken coop was filled, as Randolph had said, but he slipped in and up the stairs, leaving the news to the publisher. The place had been cleaned up more than he had expected, and there must have been new plants installed besides the blower, since the air was somewhat fresher. He found his own room and turned in automatically. Bruce? A dim light snapped on and he stared down at Sheila. Then he blinked. His bunk had been changed to a wider one, and she lay under the thin covering on one side. Down the center, crude stitches of heavy cord showed where she had sewed the blanket to the mattress to divide it into two sections, and in one corner a couple of blanket sections formed a rough screen. She caught his stare and reddened slowly. I had to, Bruce. The coop is full, and they needed rooms, and I couldn't tell them that. That. Forget it, he told her. He dropped to his own side, with barely enough room to slide between the bed and the wall, and began dragging off his boots and uniform. She started up to help him, then jerked back, and turned her head away. Forget all your thinking, Cuddles. I'm still not bothering unwilling women and I'll even close my eyes when you dress. She sighed and relaxed. There was a faint touch of humor in her voice then. They called it bundling once, I think. I, Bruce, I know you don't like me, so I guess it isn't too hard for you. But sometimes, oh damn it, sometimes you're nice. Nice people don't get to Mars. They stay on Earth, being careful not to find out what it's like up here he told her bitterly. For a second he hesitated, and then the account of the newsboy and his would-be killers came rushing out. She dropped a hand onto his, nodding. I knew. The kid. Rusty's friend wrote down what they did to him. Gordon grunted. He'd almost forgot about the tongueless kid for a second. His thoughts churned on. Then he got up and began putting on his uniform again. Sheila frowned, staring at him and began sliding from her side, reaching for her robe. She followed him down the creaking stairs and to the room where Schulberg, Mother Corey, and a few others were still arguing some detail. They looked up and he moved forward, dragging a badge from his pouch. He slapped it down on the table in front of them. I'm declaring myself in, he told them coldly. You know enough about security badges to know they can't be forged. That one has my name on it, and rating as a prime. Do you want to shoot me, or will you follow orders? 
Randolph picked it up and fumbled in his pocket, drawing out a tiny badge and comparing them. He nodded. I lost connection years ago, Gordon, but this makes you my boss. Then give it all the publicity you can and tell them security has just declared war on the whole damn dome section. Mother, I want all the dope we found. With that, about the only supply of any size left. He could command unquestioning loyalty from every addict who hasn't already died from lack of it. Mother Corey nodded, instant understanding running over his putty-like face. Schulberg shrugged. After your deal with Prager, we'd probably follow you anyhow. I don't cotton to security, Gordon, but those devils in there are making our kids starve. Mother Corey heaved his bulk up slowly, wheezing, and indicated his chair at the head of the table. But Gordon shook his head. He'd made his decision. His head was emptied for the moment, and he wanted nothing more than a chance to hit the bed and forget the whole business until morning. Sheila was staring at him as he shucked off his outer clothes mechanically and crawled under the blanket. She let the rope fall to the floor and slid into the bed without taking her eyes off him. Is it true about security sending a ship? She asked at last. He nodded, and her breath caught. What happens when they arrive, Bruce? She was shivering. He rolled over and patted her shoulder. Who knows? Who cares? I'll see that they know you weren't guilty, though. Stop worrying about it. She threw herself sideways as far from him as she could get. Her voice was thick, muffled in the blanket. Damn you, Bruce Gordon. I should have killed you. End of chapter 15